Um, I tried to think of a really witty or impacting song, um, but in the end I just had to show something I like. But I do, I do appreciate that. It might seem a little bit arrogant. Here comes the sun, and, and anyone who knows me knows I'm no sunshine. Um, however, um, as we're on a roll, let's start with even a bit more arrogance. Um, I guess I'm, I, I kind of headed this up a little bit. I, I'm the exception, not the rule, and oh well, what a cracking start. Um, so, so uh, you know, um, I'll explain, however. I do have to refer to my notes because I have a massive tendency to waffle. Um, I can go off on a tangent, so sorry if I keep looking down, it just keeps me on track a little bit. Um, but be before I start, I just wanted to reflect a little bit on um, what happened yesterday. Um, and the thing that struck me probably most was Laura, if asked to do this again, asked to go first. Okay, I had to, I've got such a big kind of, um, kind of, such inspiration talks to follow, and, and you know, I'm not sure that I'm going to, um, going to do this um, just. But to start with, I was going to um, kind of give kind of some like, whoa, look at me, it's 22 years since I finished my last treatment, uh, but thanks to Elwyn, I kind of, that's ruined. Uh, I was going to talk about uh, new, new um, I was kind of like pioneering surgery and going off here, there and having surgery and thanks to Milan, yeah, that one's not working. <laughs> Um, and oh yeah, some of the achievements I've had, and then we had James Wire and oh yeah, brilliant. <laughs> but during the day yesterday, um, I had the privilege to spend some time and to talk to a young man who was inspiring in what he said. Um, and then listening to um, James's talk as well, it, it did something to me that during my whole 22 years it's never done before, and for the first time, I thought, wow, this could be my lad. Um, my son's 16, and it's kind of given me the slightest little glimmer of how my mum felt 22 years ago. Um, and it was something I've not been prepared for, to be fair. And um, so, so it's a different perspective for me. So, so all that in mind, um, I suppose my, my kind of talks about life after sarcoma, but I suppose I need to kind of put it back into context of um, how I got there first, and um, so it'll be a stop tour, I promise, of 22 years. Um, so, in 1990, um, it was the July, I experienced pain in uh, my right leg. Um, I, was, I was an active 10 year old, I did hockey and stuff at school, um, and just a little bit unusual, so mum took me down to A&E, and, &E, and Nothing. They weren't. They weren't. Seem to be worried. It was a little bit hot, but they said, "Let's give it. Give it a couple of weeks, and if it still hurts. Come back." And it didn't. It didn't hurt at all. Um, and so, uh, right. So, carried on with, with my life. Um, I guess you, you'll never. You'll never get this, but I'm quite. Uh, I like centre stage a little bit. And um, so, it was in the December, and I went to a friend's party, and I wouldn't dance. Um, and my mum found that was quite odd, but I just sat. I'd got off my food, I sat and didn't really get involved in the whole thing and um, it came quite apparent that the pain had, had started to come back in my leg. So we went to see my GP and from, uh, so I saw the GP, I was referred to a bone specialist within the week, I had an x-ray, a biopsy, um, I was admitted and I started my treatment on the 6th of January 1991. Again, exception, not the rule. I was very, very lucky, um, you know, that's something I remind myself of daily, um, that I, 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 you know, and again, this is why it's so important to get diagnosis early. Um, just a little bit about that, that experience during time. We were told that I had an infection um, why I went in for a biopsy, and um, my mum, my mum um, asked the doctor, if it's an infection, why aren't you treating it? Why are the, you not having antibiotics? And the reply was, well, we don't know what type of infection. Um, to which, gut instinct, and I get, um, the parents in the room here, um, I guess you know, you know when something's not right. And my mum knew, and she said, she's got cancer, hasn't she? And to that, in the middle of an open ward, the consultant put his hand on my mum's shoulder and said, you did force me to tell you, Miss Horton, and walked off. So my mum was left with any thoughts. <laughs> that, that, that was how we found out. And um, my mum had literally four minutes or so to, to pull herself together because I was coming from <coughs> the hospital school. And I saw my mum was upset. And um, if I can give any advice to any of you, we have to package things differently for these people, but you must be honest. 
Um, and that's what I had all the way through my treatment. Um, I asked my mum if I would die. If I, if I die. And she's, yes, yes, you could die, but I'm not going to let you. Um, and so from that was kind of the patch we made. I asked, I asked the doctor very quickly, can you amputate my leg? I want to go home. I don't want to be here. Um, and apparently that, that wasn't going to be the option because I'm still about to have the treatment. Um, so so we, went on, we went on this journey together and um, the options to me at the time were amputation, were a prosthesis, or at the time there was this new thing that was going around which was a bone transplant. Um, and uh, I was given the option to have um, this pioneering surgery. Um, and, and I took it. Um, so on um, May the 8th, 1991, I had a bone transplant. Um, and, uh, and, and I was the youngest in the UK. I'm not sure I still hold that record. Um, but I, but I were, it was at the time. And, and I know that's something that they, they don't perform now. It, it was deemed not the most successful operation. Um, and I'm pleased to say 22 years later, um, I still have, um, still have my leg and, and I still have... Um, I still have uh, the dough bone. Uh, I had my last treatment on uh, the 21st of January 1992. Again, um, a massive success. I've been very fortunate. I've had no reoccurrence. So again, it's the exception, not the rule. So what happens now? Um, so I go to late effects clinic. Um, I go, I go yearly, which is on the children's, uh, the children's late effects clinic, which is highly amusing because every time I go there. Um, when they say my name, I see the, the, the doctor, um, all the parents are like, well, oh, that's a child, and there I am trotting along. Um, but, you know, so, so they're, they're monitoring me, um, and which I, you know, again, really lucky, because I get a full MOT every year. Um, they're, they're, the things are, though, that they, they don't, they can't answer some of the questions, um, and you kind of made to feel, in the nicest way, like, well, really, you know, you, yeah, you're still alive, you know, come on, live your life. And you kind of felt, you felt like you're left on your own because the day you stop your treatment, the care goes. That supportive network um, that, that, that you're given from your consultants to your, uh, um, your friends with on the ward, it, it disappears. Um, well, that was my experience. I'm hoping things are slowly getting better. Um, I was told, because of the intensity of my chemotherapy, um, it was that high dosage um, that it left me with heart problems and kidney and etc. And I was told I couldn't have children. So in 1996, it was quite a shock to find myself pregnant um, with my son, 16. He's uh, 16 now, and that, that's kind of where I'm trying to come back full circle of how it made me feel, as what it might feel like to be a mum in, 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 in the situation of finding that your child had been diagnosed. Um, just slightly going back again, um, because of the uh, chemotherapy, the, the f initial bone transplant didn't take, so I'm, the year after I had, um, I had a bone graft, uh, which, which has been successful, and um, I've only had one further surgery since then, which was three years ago, which was to replace the neck, it started to protrude into my knee, um, but, but um, everything's going well. Um, so I guess... The question is really, it, it, it's for me, it's about, we hope, you know, we hope that in time and with all of us together, we can, we can make a difference. We can ensure that people's prognosis is better. And if that's going to be the case, then, then what are we going to do to ensure that there's quality of life after treatment? Um, because there are things that are, are unexplained. I mean, during treatment I had shingles twice. And, and that again was my land's experience. I've had shingles a further seven times since. Um, is that because of immunosuppressant? Is that because, you know, or would I have anyway? Um, nobody commits to anything. And like practical things, I can't get life insurance. Um, I can't get critical health care or anything um, like that because I'm just not a, I'm not a safe bet, I guess. Um, it's things like that I think that the charity needs to hopefully start looking for. And I hope that's kind of, that is our priority in time to come. Um, so on May, um, in May, um, in May, uh, May 2010, um, I had the privilege, and it was the exact date to my surgery, to be interviewed for the role of BCRT trustee. 
Um, and it, it's that that's driven, um, and it's been driven by my passion to find a way to research to bone cancer, to improve early diagnosis, and therefore improving prognosis. We cannot accept that there have been no improvement rates in the past 30 years. So today, I am fortunate, lucky, and privileged to stand in front of you. So please now, let me become the rule and not the exception. Thank you.